All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mike. I'll be going through some uh, 2D CAD and MIL today. Um, not really making a specific part. We'll probably end up making something quick and simple, but I was running into some things earlier, just messing around. Uh, I didn't get to spend as much time doing uh, my prep as I would have liked because uh, I was doing some online trading earlier. So I just wanted to go through a couple things that I run into every once in a while, but it's always one of those things that if you don't do it every once in a while, you kind of forget. So I was just messing around with the shape library earlier, coming up with just some part files uh, to, to try and use with you guys. Um, something you could follow along with real simple. And I started out with this uh, slotted plate here. Now, when I was creating this slotted plate, I ended up making it four by four. So I'm just going to go four by four. And then the slots themselves, what are they? That's the number three is the distance between each slot. So I'll say one inch. Number four is the height of the slots. So I'm just going to go ahead and put that at uh, three inches. And then finally, number five is the width of the slot. So I'll make those, uh, we'll say 0. 0.625. Whoops, double decimal. And then we'll just do three slots. Now, I was playing with this, and then I took the center of the right side. So we're going to click this area for the origin and say I want to use the right center. And I just want to put it right there on X, Y, Z, zero. All right, and then when I'm done, I can hit OK. And then normally at this point, I'd cancel off. But what we're going to then do uh, is just take another file. Uh, I'm using this five-hole flange here. But this time, I'm going to take the uh, center left, or left center, what they call it here, and line it up right there. And these two are going to kind of just connect, and we'll trim out the, the pieces in between. It's a real simple part file, but it'll show us something. So we're going to look at that. So... Uh, first, let's go ahead. That's four inches. So I'm going to make sure that this one is, we'll say, 3.5. Uh, actually, it's 3.5 for number two. So 3.5. This could be five inches or whatever. It doesn't really matter. So I just wanted the, the 3.5 tall because what that's going to leave us is a quarter inch left of material. And I want to put a fillet on it. Uh, for the whole sizes in the center, that's fine. I will sp uh, spread them out just a little bit more. Let's go with uh, number five. We'll put that at three inches. Number six, we'll put that at two inches. And let's just say we'll make them a little bit bigger. We'll make them five ace holes. That's fine. Uh, and then down here, again, center uh, left center on X, Y, Z, zero. And then for number seven missed one sorry we're gonna put that at zero and that's the corner radius that's left on this file normally so i'm gonna go ahead and just hit okay and cancel out so after i did this i just went into quick trim and just trimmed out these entities right here now right here i want to put a fillet going this way and a fillet going that way and some of you guys may have run into this uh before um, when I do this, if I go up to create 2D and I go into fill it and I leave it at a quarter of an inch because the length of that line right there is exactly a quarter of an inch, it won't put a fillet on it. So the way that you'd have to do this, you could go into your fillet and, and, you know, use your tolerances and do something like a four, you know, nine, uh, that's a three, nine, four, nine. And I'll just do a single corner click, and that one will fit. But if I go back to 0 0.25, it'll always show up with this weird looped fillet. And so the only way to get it to fit is to, to just make it a little bit uh, smaller. Or, and this is where it gets fun, you can put the fillet in yourself. Now, we know where the center of the arc is going to be uh, based off of these two points here, this corner here and that corner there. So I'm going to go up to point, and then right here in the middle, we have the incremental function. Now I want to put a quarter inch fillet on here. So I'm going to move over an eighth of an inch, and I'm going to move up an eighth of an inch or down. It just depends on which one we're doing. So this one for X, I'm going to say 0.125. And for Y, I'm going to say 0.125. Now this is going, going to now allow us to pick a point and then go from that point a certain distance away, whatever distance we want to go. Uh, and that's this distance here. So I just hover over this line, make sure you get the snap point, and then I'm going to click. And that puts down where we're going to put a center point for an arc. I'm then, I'm then going to set my X to minus 
0.125 and y minus 0.125. That's going to then go to this corner here. So I have just these two points. Uh, they look they're they're parallel to each other or they're they're mirrored of each other. Uh, but that should be just fine. I just want to use that distance. So now I'll go to the arc command, and I'm in I'm in version 34 right now, so I do have the uh, diameter option available. If you're doing um, if you're in version 33 or previous, you'll have the radius. So just type in your diameter and divide it by two. But I'm just going to type in my diameter as a quarter of an inch, and then I can pick where this goes. Now notice right now my cursor is moving around the center. Uh, I this annoys me heavily uh, and what it is is it's that the arc will not snap unless it's at a location that is a factor of in my case a 16th of an inch so as you move your cursor you'll see it kind of jump that's jumping every 16th of an inch what i want to do is i want to turn that feature off first i want to get rid of that one so now i'm free to drag it and my cursor stays in the middle the other one is I'm going to turn off the construction geometry and the XY tracking. Uh, it just seems to get in the way whenever you're going to a second point. So when I click on this point and then I go to this point, it's like it doesn't want me to. So I'm just going to turn that little button off there. The one between the two you can leave on, those are your cam tree flyouts. So you're just going to leave those guys turned on. And then I'm just going to snap an arc on both of those points. And again, the reason we have to do this is because when you do a fillet in Bobcad, it's going to create a, the, the length is basically, the length has to be larger than the diameter that you're trying to put in. So for me to put a quarter inch fillet on here, I'd need at least a little over 0.25. And mine right now is exactly 0.25. Something like 0.251 would fit this. Uh, same with going with a fillet that's smaller. If I was to go to point you know, uh, 249, that would work as well. But by going and placing these points in, specifically off the corners that we need to work from, and, and really this might be a little bit different if you weren't using a 90 degree corner, so be careful with it. But I'm then going to go up to utilities here and just quick trim. And then I'm just going to trim off all the extra geometry there and there and there and there. And you could kind of start seeing the path we're able to take. So I'll just make sure to trim off that area there and that whole area there. So now I have this nice tangent transition, uh, perfect fillets. And uh, yeah, the tool will be able to go in and cut that. And while I'm here with quick trim, I'll also trim out the points that we have just to get them out of the way. Uh, to get them on the other side, I would work a lot less uh, by just going up to utilities and then mirror. And I'd pick those two arcs. And then we just tell it to mirror across the correct plane, which we have really three planes to mirror across. I'll use my, there's my XZ. We also have XY, uh, but we'll go with the XZ plane here and you'll see your preview. Make sure to hit copy before you hit OK or you will lose your originals. And then I'll just hit OK and cancel out. And then from there, just use the same quick trim command to trim off the straight lines that were there. Just like that. So I now have my radius in there. So it happens, I feel like it happens to everyone at some point where you go to put a fillet on the part and it just won't put the fillet on the part. It's too large for that area. So again, your choices are either make your fillet smaller, somehow make your edge larger, or you can use the point incremental and kind of plan out where the center point of your arc would need to be based on the corner and then just click it uh, put your points down and then snap an arc to it and, and just trim it out. Um, happens every once in a while. Just depends on what you guys run into. Another thing I realized just uh, a few weeks ago working with some guys that a lot of guys don't realize is in the system is the uh, entity modify command. Uh, entity modify allows us to modify entities. Um, so a real simple one, if I grab my select tool and I pick an arc, Right there, it's selected, and you can only do one at a time. If I pick two, I don't have the ability to do an entity modify. But if I only have one selected and I go down to entity modify, I could change anything about this arc right now. I could change the center location where it's placed. I could change the diameter uh, or the radius, depending on what you got. And I could even change the start and the end angle. 
I, I do this a lot with um, arcs because sometimes when you import a part or some uh, when you explode an arc or, or just different things with arcs, um, sometimes you end up with an arc that doesn't go from zero to 360. It looks full on the screen and it is a full 360 degrees, but it starts somewhere else. Um, basically, if, if my arc started at 15 degrees, it would end at 375 degrees because that still gives us 360 full degrees of rotation. The problem is when I go to trim this arc or when I go to make changes to this, it might not trim and it might not work in the same way as a normal arc. And for Bobcat, a normal arc, the zero degree position is always going to be at three o'clock. So this point right here that's on the line right along the X there is always your zero location. And so from there, we go counterclockwise and count up. So we have 0, 90, 180, 270, and then back to 360. So 360 and 0 are the same position. All right. And so that's really helpful to know when it comes to trimming things. If you ever go to trim an arc and it doesn't trim uh, the way you'd expect it to, it's usually because the break of the arc, the point between 0 and 360, uh, is in a weird spot or or it's in its normal spot. You have to trim both the top and the bottom off. But the modify option lets me go in and change this to zero and back to 360. And then I can hit OK. And that's going to be a good clean arc. Um, a lot of times when I use this, it'll be because an arc itself, if I go to my divide button, uh, we'll break it into you know 20 pieces. A lot of times you'll get an arc that's broken, especially if you get DXF files and stuff, you get arcs that might be broken into other segments of arcs. And so what I've done here is I've broken this arc into 20 separate pieces now. And what this allows me to do is, well, really what I do is I pick one entity of that arc like that, just, just select one of them. And then I drag a box over the rest of them and I hit delete. This is really used for when cleanup optimize doesn't work. Uh, in my case, it's such a simple break divide that a cleanup optimize would have put it all back together for me. I wouldn't have even, even had to mess with it. Um, but another way of doing it, another pretty quick way of doing it, is to just isolate one piece of the geometry, then click on it, right click and go to your entity modify, and you can change it. So this is going from 342 to 360. Now it's going to go from 0 to 360. And it'll rebuild that arc. It'll have the same center point, the same diameter. Everything about it's exactly the same. All right. And there we have it. Now, another thing that some people run into, and I'm just going to delete these connecting lines real quick. Another thing people run into when they're creating arcs is a lot of times you get portions, you know, small portions of arcs and you want the full thing. Now, at this point, if we were drilling holes, this is enough information for Bobcad to uh, recreate or drill a hole, uh, but it doesn't look right. I would never want to use this as my part that I'm gonna work from. I'd rather see full circles there. So yes, you could go in and pick each individual one and go down to Entity Modify and do all that stuff. Another very quick way of doing it is with the Create 2D, point pattern function. Now, before you do that, just make sure to get the diameter of the hole. So just measure it, measure your arc, and it'll tell you right there, diameter and radius. You're really going to want to know the radius because although most features in the system have gotten a diameter option added, this is one that does not have it. Everything you do with this point pattern feature is done in radiuses. So that's the number we need, just makes it easier to grab that information beforehand. And so we'll just go up to create 2D and then point pattern. Now, right here, we define the radius. So 0.3125. And I can actually go and pick all of these arcs. And what you'll see is it'll connect them all together. And what it's actually doing is it's rebuilding the arc, grouping them together, and it's deleting the arc underneath. So you're not going to end up with duplicate arcs on this one. So we'll hit OK and cancel out. And what we're left with is a group of holes. Now, a group of holes can be good. Some guys like to use the, the group of holes when they're drilling and stuff. If you're one of the types that always makes solid models out of your parts, if you're going to turn your wireframe into a solid model so you can get a good representation of it, um, really good idea. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Um, this is this is a good way of regrouping your holes, but it's not good if you're going to go and extrude geometry. Uh, Bobcad will not let you select that geometry for an extrusion. Or can you now? Oh, they changed it in 34. Cool. Never mind. You don't have to break it anymore. You used to have to explode it, which I would still do just because I like to have individual pieces of geometry, but they finally fixed it. So that's good news. You can see it right there. They do have a pattern mask. If you're using 33 and under, you, you wouldn't be able to do this uh, as far as I can remember. Maybe they did fix it in 33 and I'm thinking of 32 and under. But something, if one of you guys is using 33, give it a try. Just make a whole pattern and then go try to extrude it. Or yeah, extrude cut shows it as well. So we must be able to do it now. Uh, but again, if you're using one of the older systems, you might not be able to do that. Uh, in the past, you couldn't. So this is the first time I've tried it. But what we then do, what I normally do if I couldn't do my extrusion that way, we go to utilities. And then right here, we have explode. Now, anytime you explode a hole pattern or an arcade, a point pattern, hole pattern, same thing, anytime you explode that, what we're going to do is we're going to clear out the points from the inside. Basically, we're going to separate all of the geometry from it. So when I click this and I just hit OK, all the points will disappear. And that's kind of my first sign that it, it's working and I just broke all those holes apart. Uh, another way of kind of seeing it real quick and easy is just grab your select tool and pick them. Now, if you were to go and explode this geometry a second time, you would actually break those holes into separate uh, pieces of geometry, into lines or arcs, whatever it breaks into, depending on what you have selected over here. If I was to say, turn off the with arcs option, then when I explode this arc, it'll break into a bunch of line segments. Uh, I don't want a bunch of line segments, so I'll leave it like that. Uh, but where is it? Uh, but when you do your initial explode on the group, it doesn't affect the holes that are underneath it. And that's important to know. I had one guy get stuck for way longer than he should have trying to do it, thinking he was he was going to explode his whole geometry into line segments. When one, the default setting in explode is with arcs on. So it would never explode, explode it into line segments unless they're supposed to be line segments. Um and so he was working with this. It was yeah, a couple years ago that that he was running into this not being able to extrude. So you just got to make sure to explode the hole patterns. That'll leave you with all your complete holes. And then you can extrude them. Again, that would be, a, according to this, version 34 can now extrude them. 33, 32 may not be able to. It'll be something I'll have to test out and see. Uh, by the way, you guys have a questions box somewhere on your screen. I'm not sure exactly where it'll be, depending on where you put your stuff, I guess. Uh, if you have any questions, throw them into that questions box for me. Let me know what you're running into, and we'll go from there. So thanks, guys. One sec, I gotta take a drink. All right, so continuing on with uh we'll just continue on with this part i'm gonna hit undo a few times and bring back my slots there and then i am gonna go and change just these two i'll do that one and that one so i'm just gonna delete those and just convert those into uh just holes quick ones so there point pattern that's the right size so we'll pick all four of them and hit okay and then cancel. And then once again, I'll just go in and explode that thing. Just like that. So this is not going to be a crazy part. I guess we'll just go go through some tool pathing with this one. Uh, I've got a question when I'm programming a part that I'm working on when we get there. All right, Brock. Yeah, I'm going to start programming here shortly. And uh, we'll just kind of look at everything. So I want to uh, start off with uh, well, the for machining, we always have to start at the same exact point, we got to make our stock. So that's going to be the first thing we do. Before I do that, let's throw some fillets on these sharp corners that we got around the part. Uh, so I'm just going to go create 2D fillet. And with this one, I should be able to do chains because uh, we're only doing the outside corners. And it shouldn't touch those. Just cut those corners. And there we go. So you can see the preview puts that in there. Uh, remember when you're doing a... a chain of geometry when you're trying to pick all of it hold shift and then click on the chain and it'll select the entire 
uh, piece of geometry if it's connected together. Remember, if there's a gap in the geometry or even duplicate geometry, it might uh, give you a hard time. If you're worried and think you might have some broken geometry that might read a little bit differently or, or you're not able to get your chain select, the first thing to do is go to utilities and then clean up optimize. Any time, really, I mean, honestly, there's not a bad time to use this thing. If you have wireframe geometry on your screen, even if you're pretty sure that you didn't add any duplicates, go ahead and run this thing. It's going to do a lot more than just erase duplicates. It also rebuilds broken geometry that should be one piece. It's a lot of stuff that I never even noticed that it fixes. I don't anticipate I'm going to have any duplicates here, but when I hit OK, I can verify that when it pops up and tells me how many corrections were made. We got zero corrections made this time. So that's a good sign. That's It either means the geometry is really good or it's really, really bad. Um, and I've had that situation before. A lot of the times that happens when you look at a you know an arc piece of geometry and it's broken. If you start measuring all the pieces of the arcs, you'll find minor differences in either their you know X Y Z center point or their radius or diameter. They might be a little bit different from each other. You know, looking at it from the viewer and now it looks like an arc, but when you go to touch it with your cursor, it'll light up as multiple pieces. That's where you'd have to find the segment that well, there's kind of two ways to handle it. Either find the segment that is the right diameter and has the correct um, center point and then rebuild that using the entity modify function or delete pretty much everything but one entity and then edit that entity and move it to the right position. So it's, it's all dependent on how you want to kind of go about it after that. So there we go. All right. So right here I have my cam tree and i'm just going to start by right clicking here on cam defaults and then i'm going to go to new job if you forget any of these steps i'm always going to show you guys the same thing it's the cheat sheet that's part of the help system uh, there's a shortcut to the help system on the screen right now it's right under the x and you're going to go right here to where it says help it's a little question mark circle there so when we open up the help system, and again, if you guys have been in one of these with me before, you know this already, but just as a refresher, when you open the help system, it always loads to the exact same page. And that's important because we want to take the exact same steps every time. So it always opens to the introduction page, other than I think maybe on the initial install, it might open up the what's new. But after that, if you're loading the help system from this from Bobcad, so he's going to load to this page here. We're always going to go down to right here where it says using cam. And then when it loads up, we're going to open up the read me first cam quick guide here. Now, this shouldn't be something you guys need to reference every time. Uh, and honestly, to me, it's missing a big step, uh, which would go in between step three and four. So step one is we have to start a new job. This is where we define in Bobcad what style of job we're running. If it's mill, if it's lathe, if it's mill turn or wire EDM, those are the four job types. Uh, laser, plasma, water jet falls under milling for that. So after we define our new job, we then would go into setting up the stock. This is us setting up a piece of material that we're going to cut this part from. Uh, then we have our stock material. So what are you actually cutting this thing from? Is it uh, aluminum, you know, steel, whatever it is, you're going to pick your material. Now, from there, it goes right into the toolpath feature. So it says add, you know, add your cam features, which it is a fine step to do. And a lot of you guys probably do do it that way. Uh, what I would recommend kind of throwing in between that, and again, this really does depend on how you work, and it's uh, probably the reason it's not on this list, but Go into your tool crib, set up your tool crib. I don't use Bobcad to calculate feeds and speeds. I use G Wizard for everything. Um, but the biggest reason a lot of guys don't use Bobcad's feeds and speeds, or when they do use them, they're wrong, is because you're not setting your tools up. Uh, all, a lot of the tools that come with the system are high speed steel tools. And if you're going right from our library or you're going right into your tool pathing features, it's always going to pick a tool that's kind of standard inside the inside the um, the library. So usually it's going to be a half inch flat for any two axis and a half inch ball for any three axis. 
The problem is, if you don't go and tell us that the tool is high-speed steel or carbide or an inserted tool, uh, we're just going to assume it's high-speed steel because that's the default for most of the tools. There is ways to fix that, though. Inside the tool library, so let me bring up my tool library here. Uh, I'm just going to hit OK on here. So inside the tool library, I can get into, into it either under the uh, milling tab or it's actually under the cam tab as well. You have your tool library or right here in the cam tree. Just right click on milling tools and then tool library. Uh, what I've done in the past with customers, uh, let's see if this is going to load up. There we go. Is And, and we've done this during online trainings because it's it's very annoying. When all your tools are carbide other than maybe some, you know, you might have some high speed steel drills or, or whatever you have. Um, what you could do is just open up the category that you use most often. I wouldn't, rec I mean, you don't have to go into barrel mills and change these to carbide if you've never used a barrel mill. You know, same with drag, you know, lollipops and, and all these other ones. Mostly just the end mill roughs and finishes, maybe your chamfer mills, all that kind of stuff. But you go into the category and if you scoot over to the right side here, you'll see the tool materials. Now, all the ones that are in here right now that say carbide, are ones that I've used and I've switched to carbide. I haven't done all of them, as you can see, because a lot of these are just you know, sizes I'm, I'm not using super often, or I don't know, I do use three quarter inch tools often. I just must not have changed it. To change the tool material, all you gotta do is double click on the tool that you wanna change. So I'm just gonna double click on this three quarter inch flat end mill. And right there at the bottom is the tool material setting. So what you do is you just say, I want to use carbide on that. Go to the next one, carbide. Go to the next one, carbide, uh, high speed. Okay, so carbide. And you just go through and set them up. The reason that's nice is if you have all the tools in here the right way, then even if Bobcad goes to pick our our default tool, which is our it's tool, tool 89 uh, right here, our half inch flat end mill, even if it picks that tool, which normally is high-speed steel, uh, it would grab a carbide version of it. So at least you're going to be calculating closer. You also have to remember that every material that's in the system, so let me expand stock here and then edit my feature. Uh, I'll just look at, let's go down to 6061 here, and I'll just double-click on this. Now, what this does is it pulls up all the feeds and speeds. So it has... For carbide, the surface footage per minute, the surface footage while tapping, and then right here you have your chip loads. And this is really what we're using to calculate all this. So if this is not the correct chip load for your tool, this is where you need to change it. Uh, the problem is the chip load, or you change it inside the feature really, you could change it wherever. This is your default setting. So pretty much any tool you pick that's carbide is going to pull in with these settings. You can always go in and modify those settings when you're working on your, um, when you're going through your features. Uh, I use G-Wizard. It's a program made by CNC Cookbook. Uh, if you guys have ever seen it, I strongly recommend it. I love the program. Uh, literally just, you punch in the diameter of the tool, the material of the tool, and then you give it a little bit more of the information. What's your depth of cut? What's your step over? And it calculates your feeds and speeds for you. And so far, I'm at 100% uh, accuracy with it. When, I, when it talks about breaking a tool, it has a whole deflection section that breaks down uh, the deflection that's applied to your tool at the depth, using the stick out, really all the information you'd give it. Uh, and it'll tell you if a tool is going to break. And the two times I have not listened to it, my tool broke. Um, other than that, I've gotten real close with some other ones, but even like in G-Wizard, it said it was going to be a high deflection, um, and it was a high deflection. We thought for sure it was going to snap, but then we were able to come in, use a few spring passes, and just slowly work it in. Um, it's also got a lot of tips for, for conventional versus climb milling. It bases everything off of your, um, your depth of cuts and your step overs. Uh, even if it's not a product you would purchase or you want to purchase, I do strongly recommend going on there. You can download a demo of it. I think it was a, a 60 day long demo. Uh, you buy a lifetime license of it and you get signed up for uh, a newsletter that uh, Bob who runs CNC cookbook sends out. Some of the best information I've gotten is from him. 
Um, he's the one that really I, I finally listened to when he talked about never cutting with a 50%, excuse me, step over. Uh, that's the, the reason I go 40 or 60% when I do my step overs for two, excuse me, two axis. Now I got it from him. He's also got really good videos that break down climb versus conventional milling, uh, and when to use one and when to use the other. Uh, it's not just as simple as you're running a mill, you should climb, you're running a router, you might conventional. He actually breaks it down. So, you know, when you're using a specific step over, it might be better to go with a conventional. Uh, all that stuff's on his blog on the website. I strongly recommend checking them out uh, if you struggle with feeds and speeds like I do and a lot of uh, a lot of you guys do. Um, just talking to you. I've had many guys ask me how they figure out how to figure out feeds and speeds. And uh, that's been the best answer I can give them so far. Uh, it, it really has everything kind of built into it. All different tool types, too. You can use it for drilling, uh, engraving. I just used it for some thread milling with a customer. Uh, and and feeds and speeds were were spot on. So there we have it. Now, I didn't do my stock yet. Uh, so I'm just going to right-click here on stock and go to the stock wizard. And basically just use a rectangular piece of stock that, that fits the shape there. Um, let's go ahead and make it a little bit bigger. Actually, we don't have to make it any bigger. Uh, so what we're going to say is we're starting out with a, a nine by four piece of stock. It's all faced up. It's all squared up. We're good to go. So the only things we'll have to do is shave off these corners and kind of shave out that section there, uh, which we will do uh, using just profiles. We're going to try that out. And then the other thing I'll do just to make it so I got something to hold on to, uh, I'm going to add on the offset minus for Z. I'm going to go ahead and add just a quarter inch of material, so 0.25. And I'll just say that's what we're holding on to, and we'll go an inch deep. Uh, it's whatever depth you want to go. From here, we go next, and I'm going to go ahead and pick my origin as the bottom left-hand corner right here. Uh, you could also pick you know, top dead center on the part if you wanted to, whatever works best for you. You'll notice that top dead center, this part is not perfectly centered on XYZ0. Uh, because the uh, we'll kind of break it down into two sides here. This left side's four inches wide, the right side's five inches wide. So uh, I didn't adjust anything. I didn't recenter anything. You don't have to. You can have this part floating out in the middle of nowhere. As long as Bobcad finds it and puts the piece of stock around it, where you're picking, what you're picking now when you're picking the origin is the point in which you're going to zero all your tools out at the machine or you're going to zero out your machine you're going to set up your work offset your g54 whatever you want to call it that's what you're setting up right there so it, in bobcad it really doesn't matter where this part sits inside the cad window i do usually try to get it to be close to center at least i feel like anytime i'm away from my center point rotating starts to get harder uh but having your part real close to center gives you a, a, the easiest types of rotations i'd say so that's our stock one inch thick that looks good uh, for me i just have to add in a z offset for my work offset because i have the simulation pro and so i have a machine that shows up in my simulation so i'm just going to go ahead and put this out we'll say 1.75 and you know you could actually put a vice in here if you wanted to you could line it all up i'll just go 1.75 and then the clearance plane set to one inch. Remember, this is the only place that you could set the clearance plane, and it's the default value. If this isn't high enough, kind of this, the, if this isn't the safe area above all the geometry on your part, make this taller. Uh, again, only time to change that right now. So you hit OK. I mean, that's kind of a lie. You can always hover over the cam tree fly out here, and uh, you could actually change your clearance plane on the fly. But as you go through your features, you know, your drilling, your two axis, three axis, you'll have your clearance plane. You can't change it inside of a feature. You can only change it here in the machine setup. And that's kind of the only place you can do it. So I want to start off by drilling. Uh, a, let's do, uh, let me see here. Let's, let's pick our tool first. So I'm just going to go into my tool crib. I want to use a half inch tool to open those holes up. I don't want to drill a five eighths hole. I want to open it up first. So I just want to find a drill that falls between a half inch and a five eighths real quick. Uh, so I'm just going to add a tool from the library, sort by my diameter. I'm just going to go down here, look for something that's got a, you know, right there, nine sixteenths drill. That's perfect. So what this will allow me to do is I'm going to go in and I'm going to drill the center of all those holes out 
with this 9 16 drill. And then I'm going to use a half inch end mill to come in and open them up to size. So I'll start with that 9 16 drill. I'll hit OK. Uh, don't worry about the order that you put tools into the crib at. It, it really doesn't matter um, because it's, it's going to show up in the order they get used for me. Uh, so I put the drill in first. Now I'm going to go add in my center drill. And I'm just going to use my half inch 90 degree spot drill there. Hit OK. And so there's my two tools. Uh, they're they're wrong. They're backwards, but I'm fine with that. And then while we're doing this other stuff, a half inch tool will leave that radius there because it's a quarter inch. Oh, no, that's a diameter. So I need to use a quarter inch tool. So I do need a quarter inch finisher. So I'll say end mill rough. We're going to go ahead and pick our half inch tool. So I'll pick my half inch flat end mill standard. And again, if you want to change your material, your tool materials at this point, this is not a bad time to go in. You could change them right now. You could double click on them, change it from high speed steel to carbide, uh, whatever you want to do. This is the original one. So I'll hit OK. And then finally, I'm going to go to end mill finish. Now, people always get confused on this. This is a question I get all the time. Why is there an end mill rough and an end mill finish category? And why does sometimes, you know, when you're making a tool path and you're on a finish pass, why is the tool called a rough tool? The reason the tool is called a rough tool is because that's where it came from. It came from the end mill rough category. <coughs> the end mill finish, if it says finish inside of your operation, that's because the tool that's actually chosen is from the finish section. It's from this end mill finish category. That's all it means. You can use roughing tools for finishing. You can use finishing tools for roughing. It's just which one of these two categories that tool came from. Uh, that's all it means. So I'm gonna go ahead and add an end mill finish. And this does actually save time um, because Bobcad, when we get to our finish tool paths, is now going to look and see if there is a tool inside the finish category. If there is, it's going to grab that tool. If there isn't, it's going to make up its own. It's going to be a half inch flat end mill standard. Uh, I believe it's right, uh, where are you? Right here. It's going to be this guy. The problem is with this one, I haven't changed that one to carbide yet. So if Bobcad was to grab that one, it would be the wrong tool. Uh, but for me to cut the radiuses I got on here, I'm going to go to my uh, let's look at the size here. The flute length for the standard quarter inch is three quarters of an inch. Well, I'm going one inch deep, so that's not going to work. The flute length for the long quarter inch is 1.25. That's perfect. I'm going to go ahead and double click on that. Make sure to change it to carbide and then hit OK. And that's going to add that in. So now if I go to all tools, uh, we have our center drill and our drill. And then we have our end mill rough, which we'll use to open up all these pockets. And then we have our end mill finish to clean up. That, that's what we'll use for our finish pass. Uh, so I'll go ahead and hit OK. And then right here, I'm just going to blank out my stock uh, just by hitting this eyeball. There we go. And there it is. So now I want to drill, sorry, I want to drill the same size hole in all of these. The problem is with Bobcat, it's going to try and kind of separate that uh, into separate features and it's going to try and pick a tool that matches the hole so what i want to do is i just want to add some points to the center of all these arcs and that's what i'm going to use uh, but before i do that i'm going to make a new layer so over in my layers i'm going to just add a new layer and just call it arc centers and then leave my check mark on that that way anything that i draw all these points that i'm about to draw will automatically go to that layer so i'll just go to create 2d and then point, and then I like to use this feature right here, the point from entities, and just make sure the arc center is on and nothing else. So you're gonna have to turn off the end of the end point. And then from here, I can actually just drag a box over all the things I wanna grab for my geometry. So just all these, just like that. <coughs> One second, guys. <clears throat> All right, so now I have all the points showing up. I have the previews at least. And so I'll hit OK and cancel out. Now, why I put all these points in 
it's just so that the system reads the center points because that's all that really matters to me right now. So if I turn off my CAD layer, I'm left with all the points for all the holes I need to drill. So now I'll go to my cam tree. I'm going to right click on machine setup one, and then I'm going to use the mill drill hole. Now, if you spent the time to actually go and, and create this as a solid model, hole recognition is available and you can pick a solid model and then recognize the holes that are in that model. Uh, in my case, it's still not what I wanted to do. This is probably the easiest way is just by making all these points. So I'm just going to do a mill drill hole and select my geometry and just drag a box over the whole thing and then hit OK. And because I isolated that, and I brought it to a separate pl you know, plane uh, or, or to a separate layer. I'm sorry. That is the easiest way to get it. There's no duplicates because I only extracted or created points on the centers of the arcs. It's good to go. So for the depth, I do need to manually enter this because I don't have a solid model to pick from. Uh, so I'll just say, let's go one, and that it is a through hole. For the diameter, I picked, what, 9 16. So I'm going to go 9 divided by 16. You can punch the fraction in directly, and it will get the diameter for you. And then I'll hit next. Right here, we have our feature page. Pretty much the same stuff we saw on the last page. If you notice down at the bottom, we can't go previous anymore. Um, so, yeah, just make sure you got it. Now, I did see this on Facebook uh, yesterday. It was, I think it was yesterday, a couple of days ago. Uh, whenever you copy and paste a drill feature or you reselect the geometry feature, the feature depth will get reset to a half of an inch. Um, it's it's annoying. I get it. We're, we got a bug report in for it. I know one of you, I, I think actually one of you guys that's in here now uh, worked with the tech support guys to put that in. Um, so hopefully they'll be fixing that so it saves that depth uh, eventually. I don't know when that's going to happen. If you copy and paste or if you ever repick geometry after you've computed the, the drilling toolpath, always come in here and double check this page. What ended up happening to the customer online was he had two holes selected and he had their feature depth at uh, 0.4. I think it was yeah, 400 thousandths or something. And then he realized he forgot to select a hole. So he went back, he picked the other hole, but because the hole itself, um, the, the diameter was the same, but the, the hole depth got reset to a half an inch. He ended up with two groups, one group that went from the top to 400 thousandths, and then another group that went from the top to a half inch. And so that messed up everything uh, when he went to go run the part. So always make sure to, just go back in here and check. And if you do have groups that are, let me break this. If you do end up with groups that have multiple entities, you can regroup them back together after all their depths are the same. You can only group things if their information matches. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and pick this all the way down. I'm just going to hold shift and pick to the bottom of the list here and then just say regroup those holes and it'll put it back into that group. Um, again, not exactly, it, it, it's, it's going to really depend on what you did. Sorry, I keep hitting the microphone. It's going to depend on what you did when you picked the new geometry, if you copy and pasted, but yeah, another way to get around it. And it doesn't show here. It's where it gets kind of dangerous. Just to fast forward and kind of talk about the same thing here. If you are going to copy and paste the tool path and you want the feature depth to be saved, uh, you can actually do it on the drill page or the, yeah, just the really the parameters for the drill, you'll uncheck the use cutting conditions button there. When that's unchecked, those depths that are saved in there are saved in there. They are not going to be wiped away by you picking a different piece of geometry. They're going to be there the entire time. The problem is, even with this, you know, with this being unchecked, when I pick my geometry again, it'll show up as 0.5. But because once again, this use cutting conditions is unchecked, it's still going to go an inch deep. So it really depends on what you're copy and pasting. I mean, drilling is one of those features. It could be really quick or it's one of those deceivingly long features where if you're doing it correctly and setting up feeds and speeds, you know, I would much rather set up feeds and speeds once and then copy and paste from one to another than to have to redo the whole toolpath every time. But 
if you do uncheck that button right there, uh, you will it will save all those those depths no matter what. All right, so back to here. We'll go ahead and hit next. Uh, for the strategy, what I did earlier is I chose the hole feature, which anytime I choose a hole, it gives me a center drill and a drill. So that's what I'm going to run with. For my machine sequence, we just have our sequence. Really, I'm just going to leave it on optimized. Um, it's going to figure out a, the best way. The way optimized works is it kind of puts together the closest, the pick order, and the X and Y directions, and it picks the uh, most efficient one of those. So usually this is picking a pretty good option. Um, down here is just what corner do we want to start in? If you break your part into just a, a rectangle, it's do you want to start near the lower left, upper left, lower right, or upper right? And you'll just pick whichever one you want. I'll go lower left, get up there, and then hit next. For the posting, the only thing we really have on here is the uh, your work offset. And normally you do not ever have to change this. The works work offset is made to um, to use whatever works work offset is inside the machine setup. So it shouldn't be something you really ever have to mess around with. Uh, other than that, the output rotary angle that's a option for four axis machining. Um, if you're doing some four axis machining, you're never going to use that option. So just be aware of that sometimes. Uh, you know, sometimes people get confused and start clicking buttons. That is for four axis. And even if you're doing four axis, you're not going to do it this way. So next. <clears throat> because I set up my center drill earlier, my half inch 90 degree spot. Again, that's one of the benefits of setting up your tool crib is Bobcad goes into the tool crib. It looks to see if there's a center drill. If there is a center drill, that's the one it uses. If it doesn't see a center drill, it'll always pick a number five center drill. And the same thing's gonna go with any tool. If it's looking for a specific tool type and you put that specific tool type inside your tool crib, then it'll always grab that tool type. So we'll go ahead and hit next. Right here for the parameters, this is the parameters for the center drill. So on this one, you could either set up the depth that you wanna center drill to, or you can define the center diameter at which you want the hole to kind of stop. What do you want the top of the hole to register as for the diameter? Um, in my case, I'm using a half inch, 90 degree spot. If I was using something like a three quarter inch spot, I could uh, go in and use it to chamfer the hole. Uh, but the drill that we're using is a little bit too big. And I'm cleaning out on all that uh, geometry anyway, so it doesn't really matter. And so I'll just hit next. Right here for the drill, it grabs our 916 drill. Anytime you do <clears throat> a hole inside of Bobcad, even if it's some random number, <coughs> excuse me, that you enter in for your diameter, Bobcad will make a drill that matches it. It, it will be a drill that might not even exist in the tool library or, or even in real life, uh, but we will create a tool that matches it. So just be aware of that. And again, I didn't change it on this one. My, my drill here is high speed steel. So the surface footage is 508. Um, this one is carbide. So you'll see it's using that 1320 for the for the feed rate. Um, so there it is. And then finally, we get to the parameters. Now the parameters allow us to change the cutting condition. So if you do want to change the depth at all, you can uncheck use cutting conditions, and then change your depth. The reason we have 50 thousandths extra showing right now is because whenever we tell Bobcad we're doing a through hole, we add 50 thousandths onto the total depth. The reason we have a separate, a different number in the overall depth is because that's the overall depth that the tip of the tool is going to travel to. The edge of the tool or, or past the angle here is what's gonna show up for the effective depth. So we should be going through the part uh, with our effective depth to, to get us cleared enough that when we flip this part over and face off the, um, the bottom quarter inch that we left on there, um, the the hole should go all the way through. And then also one thing to note, and I just saw a guy did this, uh, I think it was either on the forum or one of them. He had a bunch of holes set up, uh, all the same diameter hole. They were all quarter inch or actually 201s. He was getting ready to do a bunch of tapping. Uh, they were all 201s, but they were different lengths. Some were a quarter inch deep, some were a half. So what he ended up having was a standard page just like this, 
you know, just a center drill and a drill. The difference was he had multiple groups. And what ended up happening is he had these multiple groups. He went, you know, set everything the way he needed to, but he only did it for the first group. So I think he was pecking or something. When you do a peck, you have to choose peck and then define the, the peck itself. And if you have multiple groups, you'll have to then click on group two and make sure to turn on the peck. And group three, you make sure to turn on the same settings. So just be aware that going in and setting up pecking, if you have m- multiple drilled holes, but they're at different you know heights and depths and all that stuff, um, you may need to come in and, and pick the different groups before you can really mess with them. Uh, but there we go. I'll go ahead and just hit compute. And there's all five of our, or all 11, sorry, of our drilled holes right in the middle of there. So now all these parts have a half inch or a, a nine sixteenths hole in them. So now what I want to do is I want to go and machine all these pockets all the way through. All right. So I'm just going to right click on machine setup one and go down to my mill two axis. Now I'm not going to do this slot right now. I'm just going to go in and pick all these holes right here. These are all the same size. And then I'm going to hit okay. Now I'm not doing the slot and I'm not doing the larger hole because the center point is in a different location. So I'll show you that when we get there. Uh, total depth, I'll just go one inch through the part. You can go 1.1 if you want to give it a little bit more. Make sure you really clear through the part, but then hit OK. And then next. Now, there's a few ways to do this one. Uh, I'll just hit next again. On your machining strategy, you could use a profiling feature. We have, let me pull up my calculator here. Uh, The diameter of the hole is 0.625, and we've taken off 916, so 0.5625. And so we're left with just a 16th of an inch worth of material. So if you're good with taking 30 thou in one pass, absolutely go for it. It'll it'll clean it up pretty good. Actually, wait, we got that's the hole we got. Yeah. So this is the amount of material left. Uh, so you could do it as a profile if you're good with taking, you know, kind of 30 thou in one shot. You could also do something like pocketing. And this is the one I like to use. I'm going to do a pocket with a profile finish and then go next. Right here for the tabs. I'm not going to leave any tabs on any of these holes. I'm not I'm not going to keep held on to any of these parts. So I'll just go next again. And again, the posting. You got your work offset number one, the output rotary angle, and then the contour ramping. Now, this doesn't apply to anything in this tool path. It's just a setting that's here for really all the two axes. The only tool path that has contour ramping in it is the profile rough. So the only time this matters is if you have a profile rough here on the left. And all it does is it tells Bobcad that it's able to output these this contour ramping toolpath with lines or arcs. It really depends on the machine. There's some machines that won't even let you use the contour ramp uh, because the Z, uh, the last time I seen it was a few years ago because they're two and a half axis, so you can't lower it that way. All right, so we'll hit next. Right here for our roughing tool, we have our half inch flat end mill. And uh, you got your feeds and speeds down here. Again, you can see we're calculating it based on a five thou feed per tooth. I might drop that to two five, and I might drop this to 13 for the plunge or whatever's whatever's realistic. You'll see there's my feeds and speeds and a 10,000 RPM spindle. So definitely closer. This is aluminum, uh, 100 inches a minute, half inch tool. Definitely not out of line. Uh, Really is going to depend on how much I'm taking off and what I'm doing for this whole thing. So we'll hit next for the patterns. Uh, Now, with this one specifically, I like to use uh, really I don't use standard pockets anymore. I don't really see the point. Um, The real difference between an advanced pocket and a standard pocket is that the standard pocket is never allowed to do open pocketing. The advanced pocket can do open pocketing. Um, Why don't I ever use the standard anymore? Because the advanced pocket will only do open pocketing if it's allowed to, which means either you've, you've used the option that's called detect open edges here in version 34, 
or you went and drew dotted lines on any areas where the tool is allowed to leave. Remember, a dotted line signifies that there's no wall there. And so the tool can go right over it. It's actually not a bad way to clean up you know, these little areas here. What we might end up doing is, is creating a dotted line that closes this off. And we could have, instead of a tool just kind of doing a finish pass, instead of just doing a profile for it, we can actually have it kind of work its way out and take out material. Uh, we'll, we'll see what we decide to do. But the offset pocket out is always a good choice. These are round pockets. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on the use spiral for circular pockets. And this is going to convert uh, all the tool path. Instead of it having a, a linking move to connect from one pass to the next, I'm just going to use these spirals instead. Now, right now, I have a step over of 50%. And this is really the deciding factor for me on how aggressive I'm going to be with my depth of cuts. Uh, if I go with a step over of something like 5%, that's only 5% of my tool that I'm stepping over per pass around. And so this would be a really tight spiral that goes down the middle of the hole and just slowly opens up from there. Not a bad option. If I was to go with something like 40%, I might take this in multiple passes. And really, it comes down to what, what your machine is capable of. Um, guy I was doing some, some online training with a few weeks ago, uh, nice, big, heavy machine. He was doing one-inch deep cuts. I mean, granted, we're only shaving off 30 thousandths. So he was doing one-inch deep cuts after drilling the holes and just opening them up with a 3% step over is what he was using. Um, but I'll go with, we'll go with five for now. I want to climb mill, and then this use spiral for circular pockets should keep everything moving as a spiral. So from there, I'll go next. On the pat, uh, parameters page, how much are we going to leave for the finish tool to clean up? I'll just leave, we'll do 10 thou this time. And then right here, we have our steps. So I have a 5% step over. So I'm going to tell it, I just want to do, uh, well, this is the rough pass. Let's do it in two passes. So we'll do two half inch passes. Uh, just multiple steps there. And then if you ever want to do more than two passes, because anytime you do multiple steps, we just take the depth and divide it by two. If you ever want to do, say, four passes or, or six passes, you can just do the math right there. Take your total depth and divide it by the number of passes you want, and you will get that depth of cut and that number of cuts. All right, so let me set that back up. We'll just do two passes, half inch deep, and go next. For the leads, now I'm going to leave it on plunge. And I want to start with plunge because it should plunge right down the center of the hole where I left it. Otherwise, I have to create plunge points. And I really only wanted to do that on the slot that we got down there. But we'll find out. Uh, so we'll leave it on plunge. And if I don't want to use a, a plunge point, then I could also go and do something like a spiral entry in and kind of have it spiral its way down the center. Uh, just be aware that usually when you do that, the, the spiral entry has to be pretty small to go down the middle. Uh, we only have, actually, we got a 16th of an inch, so we should be fine. We'll find out. We should be able to see it in the simulation if it's going to clip the part on its way into that hole, uh, which is what I don't want. I want it to plunge down the center that we drilled and then open it up from there. Next, we have our machine sequencing. Uh, just going to turn that on optimize and kind of let it choose what order to cut all those holes in. And then we have our links, no changes, our advanced feed rates, no changes. And then right here, we have our finish tool. So grab my quarter inch end mill. For the patterns, we have two patterns, system compensation and machine compensation. System compensation means we're compensating the tool for you. Machine compensation is going to give you a G41 or a G42 that you could use or that will show up inside the code and allow you to have a little bit more control out at the machine to offset the tools, to compensate for the tools. So I like to use double comp. Basically the system is offsetting the tools. So now what that means for me is any lead in I use, as long as it doesn't go too far across the part, kind of to the other side, it's going to work. And uh, I do have the G41 comp. Um, so that's, that's perfect. So I'll just go ahead and hit next. Right here for the parameters is a finish pass. I want to leave no allowance, and I'm not going to do multiple steps. I'm only taking off 10 thousandths around the whole part. You got to think, whenever you're working with holes, a 10 thousandths allowance 
is each side. So it's actually 20,000. So we're just going to shave off 20,000 or well, 10,000 per side of the whole thing. Uh, next, we then have our leads. All right. So this is one of my favorite parts. It's one of the reasons I like drilling down the center of the holes. We know the diameter of those holes. They're all five eighths of an inch. We know what size tool we're using and we're already compensated. So I like to use right angle leads and I'll set the length to the hole diameter minus the tool diameter, just like that. Whatever you have left over, you're then going to divide by two, which we kind of already worked out this math on how much, whoops, how much extra we have. But now that length that's there should have a plunge point right down on top of this point. It's going to feed over and then cut the hole. So we'll go next. No changes to the corner types. That's not really an option anyone uses. Machine sequencing optimized. And the advanced feeds, no changes. When we're all done, we'll hit compute. And there they are. So let me blank everything out real quick. So here's our pockets. You can see it's just, just right in there. As long as that start point there is within, we'll say, a, a 30 second, um, we should be fine. We should be able to plunge down this without clipping the side of the hole first and then kind of working in. And then we have our spiral, and there should be two passes. So right there. The profile finish, let me go to a top view. That's the diameter. Did I not do the diameter right? Or did I change the diameter? Let me just measure this real quick. 0.625. Edit that. Leads. Oh, I'm using a quarter inch tool right now. My bad. Give me one second. So we go 0 0.625 minus 0 0.25. And then whatever the leftover is here, we divide that by two. That makes more sense. All right, good. So recompute that. And there we see it. With the right numbers, it works. And that's going to plunge right down the center of the hole. It's going to feed over, make its finish pass cut, and then it's going to leave. Now, one other thing you could do, uh, especially with 90 degree uh, turns here, instead of having a right angle lead that, that just gets to the end and leads out, you could also go in and let me edit my profile finish, go down to the leads, and right here we can add, add a little overlap amount. Uh, so I'll just go with 0.1875 and just hit compute. Now what you'll see is there's two lead moves. So there's our lead in. It's going to cut its way around. Instead of stopping here and then leading out, we're going to clean up that area and then lead out. You could also do something with like a circular lead in or a blended lead in. Really whatever you want to use, as long as you have the, the length set to the center of the hole, it actually works out pretty good. So there's, there's all those holes. Now for these other ones, well, we'll say this one first. Let me first take a measurement so I know what the diameter is. One inch, that's good. And to, to do those ones, I'm just going to copy the original feature I used for all, uh, all the five ace holes. And I'm just going to right click on machine setup one and say paste feature. Now when you paste everything but a drill, um, or, or any three axis, if you copy and paste three axis, it doesn't ask you any questions. So if you're copy and pasting a drill or you're copy and pasting a three axis, it won't ask you anything or won't tell you anything. When you copy and paste a pocket, a profile, it'll ask if you want to use the same top of feature and depth values. For three axis, when you copy and paste, it keeps every setting the exact same. The thing it drops is what your geometry was. And if you copy and paste a drill, it remembers what tool you used. It remembers whatever settings you had, if, especially as long as you've uh, unchecked them. But if you go and pick geometry, it might reset the depth and do some other things to you. So uh, I'm fine with using the same top and depth. They're going the same distance. Just going to right click on geometry, say reselect, pick that arc right there and hit OK. And then I'm just going to edit my feature once again. Go to the leads page for my profile finish, which I will note this length right here is fine. Uh, as of right now, I'm plunging in just fine. I'm not going to hit anything. Uh, this is the finish pass anyways. I'm really concerned with hitting something on the, on the pocket pass up above. But I do like it when my tools plunge down the center of the hole, feed over, make their cut, and then leave. Uh, so I'm just going to say one inch 
minus a quarter inch. Again, that's the hole diameter minus the tool diameter that's currently being used. And then whatever's left over, you divide by two. And so I'll hit compute and blank that guy out. There's my pocket, a bit more tool path than we had in the others. And then our profile finish right there. So now the last one is going to be this slot, which I'm just going to hide all that geometry for the points for a second. And I'm going to shrink this up. And then I'm going to copy that feature. Before I do that, let's rename this. Five eighths hole holes size up. And then I'm going to right click on this one, say rename, and then this will be the one inch holes size up. I can't type, by the way, if you didn't notice. There you go. All right, so size type. What the heck? I said type, typed it. There we go. All right, one inch hole size up. And then finally, we'll do this little slot right here. So I'm going to set this up with the five ace one just because the, the start point and everything should be set up a little bit better. So I'll copy that one. Right click down here and say paste feature. Uh, it says, do you want to use the top and depth? Yes, it's the same. And then for the geometry on this one, all I'm going to do is pick this oval, this uh, the slot that I made. And I'll hit OK. And then I could go and compute that toolpath. But first, let me rename it slot. And then I'll compute it. There we go. So this is going to create this slot. You can see the leads that I have on it right here. They, they get right to the center of the path. And that's actually a good sign. If I was to put those leads on this end instead of this edge here, uh, they go right perfect where I need them. Um, but you'll see we're no longer doing our spiral. So in here, or are we doing some sort of spiral? Let's see. I don't see any linking lines. Oh, there they are. Yeah, okay. So there's our linking moves. Let me blank this out. Here's our pocket. So those are the links. Now, what we could do is either leave those links in there, and that's how we're going to cut from one pass to the next. Right now, I'm set up, because this isn't a perfectly round pocket, the use spiral for circular pockets isn't really doing anything. Uh, so I'll hit compute here, and we'll see there's our, there's our pocket, you know, just an offset out. So there is linking moves in between there. If I edit this, another feature we have though, and and it's up to you if you use this, but the one I like is this morph spiral uh, right here, or we could use the adaptive roughing or high speed machining strategy. I'm gonna go with the morph spiral here and just hit compute. And what we'll see is instead of having those link moves right there, everything just basically gets converted into uh, a spiraled move. So it's going to spread a little bit more than it did before when we were doing just the standard offset, but it's going to get rid of those linking moves. So we'll go ahead and run it. Uh, now we can see that right now we're plunging into the material right in the center. And I haven't cleared out any material there. Uh, one thing I could do is just go create another point and slap it in the middle right there. That would work fine. And then we'd have a drilled hole right there. Uh, another way we can do this is to actually take a point and put it at the bottom of the pocket. So I'm just gonna go to create 2D and then point, and then I'll go to my incremental once again. I'm gonna not shift anything in X or Y. So those are gonna go back to zero, and then my Z I'll put at minus one. And then all I have to do is pick the point right there, and it's gonna put a point down there, and I'll just do the same on the other side, see if there's any difference. Now in the cam tree, when I expand the pocket feature, we have, or let me say the pocket operation, the features are these levels up here, but we have this drill tip position. So I'm gonna right click on it and say reselect. I'm gonna pick that point right there at the bottom and I'm gonna hit okay. From here, I'll compute the tool path once again. And then if we look at the pocket itself, we're actually plunging in down here and then we're gonna start our cut. So there it is, we'll fit all that, and there it is. So let's try that out. Let's give this a save as. Find my folder here.
All right. So now that we have it saved, and that's something I'll do pretty much every time I'm about to launch the simulation. I don't like to launch the simulation without saving just because uh, it could cause problems. So I'm just going to start the simulation here and see what we get. Now, we haven't done the outside yet, but I'm fine with that. We'll go ahead and just say uh, run. Do I have my tool turned on? Nope, there we go. Show the tool. And uh, we'll start with our center drills first. I'm going to slow that down so it doesn't go outrageously fast. So there's our little center drills. And then we're going to go in and drill them. And this one has a peck set to it. So right there. We only got five pecks, so that's not too bad. Sometimes I do this not paying attention. I'll end up with 20 packs and the simulation takes forever. So you can see there it is. It's plunging into the bottom of the pot or into the depths of the pocket, but right down the middle. And then it's just opening it up to size. You can see the little bit of difference right there. Um, it's a good way to get your, well, one, your holes are going to be round uh, compared to what they could be with your drill. And... That looks good. Okay, so there's our one inch hole. Finish pass. And then here's our slot. And I had it plunged down that hole so that we have that little bit of clearance. And then we could start pocketing it out. You know, drilling all these holes now gives us a little less uh, material for the tool to have to handle the whole time. There's our finish pass, and there it goes. Overall, not bad. I don't like the order that it ran everything in. Um, my default setting for most of my stuff is, uh, for my machining order here, it's going to be under individual feature. And so what you'll see is we have a lot of tool changes that are going from our half-inch tool to our quarter-inch, back to our half-inch, back to our quarter. So it's a lot of tool changes that we'd have to do. This is a perfect part to use individual tools. So I'm just going to pick that and then hit OK. And now what you'll see is it's going to do the center drill and the drill. Then it's going to go in and do all the half inch tool roughs and then the quarter inch finishes. So that'll be a lot more accurate. Remember, if you do make a change, the simulation even hitting restart does not change the order. It doesn't reload all that. You always got to exit the simulation and then start the simulation again. And then what you'll see over here is now we'll have all our roughs and then all of our finishes right over there. So you got all your roughs, all your finishes, and we'll end up with the exact same result, except it'll waste a little less time with tool changes. So there we go. All right, Brock, if you wanna type out your answer or your, your question, we're, we're gonna be done with this here soon so I can start putting something together. Um, just so you know. All right. So now what I got to do is just this, these outside cuts. Now it's up to you. You could do the full path all the way around the outside. Uh, again, that's totally up to you. What I'm going to do is I want to right click on here and go down to my mill two axis and select my geometry. Now the geometry for this is pretty much the outside. So I'm going to hold shift and pick the entire outside chain. But then I'm going to deselect the sides that are already done. So that one, that one, that one, and that one. And what I'm left with is just these little pieces of geometry as well as these full radius kind of pieces of geometry here. And I'm going to set the depth to, we'll go 1.1 deep this time. And then hit OK. Well, hold on, sorry. Before I hit OK, I want to go in here and look at these. I want to make sure that they're compensating or or pointing the right direction so for this one to the left will put us on the outside that's what i want for that one to the left that one to the left all right they look good so now we can hit okay sometimes you got to check your direction you might have to reverse it when you're doing this kind of thing um now for this one we could go with extensions i just don't know how the extension is going to work right here so i'm not probably going to use extensions i'll probably use just let my leads uh my leads take care of it mm -hmm. um yeah give me what uh one second guys let me do this real quick uh all right so brock 
Let me copy your email real quick. And let me new email. Ooh, move that over there. All right, so I'll send you that and then say send file here. Are you okay with me showing it during this uh, here right now, or is it a is it a is it a secret kind of part? If you're cool with me showing it here, I could I can show it to you now. Um, there we go. All right, I just sent you an email, Brock, and uh, just reply to it, attach the uh, file to it, and yeah, we'll take a look at it. Uh, let me know, are you using 33 or 34 as well? That's what I'll need. All right, so I'm going to use the leads to kind of control this thing because uh, that'll be the easiest way. Perfect, he's using 34. All right, and I'm going to use a profile rough with a profile finish. So both of them, I need that finish because I'm going to use the half-inch tool for the roughing. Tabs, no changes. Uh, posting, no real changes there. And then right here, we have our rough. So again, there's our half-inch flat rougher. Right here, we have our patterns. Now, I'm going to go with the standard first, and that should be fine. But another way we could do this is with side roughing. Uh, we don't have, I, I don't know, we don't have much material on here. So a single pass with our half edge should be good. Uh, if it is too much for the tool, we could go with side roughing and say, you know what, there's a quarter of an inch worth of material sitting there. I want to take it out in two passes, and that'll break it up a little bit for us. Uh, but again, I'll go with standard. For the compensation, I'm going to turn on G41, but just remember, this is the rough tool. If the rough leaves a little bit of extra material because it's worn, the finish pass is going to clean it up, just as long as the finish pass is you know, good enough to clean it up. So next, right here for the parameters, just going to leave 15 thousandths for the finish pass to clean up. We have our multiple steps. I'll do this in, uh, we'll do this in four steps. So I'm going to say 1.1 divided by four. Just because I don't, I mean, we uh, we could probably go a little heavier, but this isn't using a step over. So however much material is there, that's what it's taken out in one shot, minus the 15 thou. For the leads, this is where we get to choose kind of what's a good lead, uh, especially if there's a lead that fits all of them. Uh, we could go with something like a parallel lead, which wouldn't really work on these ones because it'd come off, you know, parallel. So that's not what we want. Uh, we could do a right angle lead. And that's going to come in right off the edge of that arc, straight out that way, make its cut, and then straight back out that way. Uh, not a bad option. Uh, the ones I would look towards are either a circular or a blend. Uh, I'm going to go with a circular. And then right now, this would be a, a right angle. So we'd be starting about here, and then we'd arc our way into that, and then arc our way out, and then make another right angle. Ooh, I'm almost losing this thing. I'm going to go with tangent. Let's try out a tangent movement here. And uh, we'll go tangent, quarter inch, quarter inch. And then next, for the corner types, no changes at all. For the sequencing, no changes. Uh, for sequencing, we'll turn on optimize. Doesn't really matter, though. Uh, advanced feeds, no changes. And then finally, the profile finish. This is our quarter inch tool. This is the one that can actually fit in those radiuses that we put in there earlier. So we'll go next again. Um, no real changes here other than the comp left that's something that's really you could do your save defaults on this page the only reason mine isn't is because uh, if i start saving defaults i'm going to forget what the original ones were when when you guys call for help and all that stuff so if you use g41 just about every time hit save defaults tell it to use the current template and it'll override the profile rough and the finish parameters no changes leads i'm just going to go with that blend uh, actually, what did I do on the last one? I did a, a, a circular. Let's do a blend on the finish pass and see which one we like more. For the sizes, I haven't really even changed them. The rule of thumb I follow is half the tool diameter. But if the tool's already compensated for, then it doesn't really matter anyway. And so I'll just hit next. For the corner types, no changes. Sequencing, optimized. And advanced feeds, no changes. So when we're all done, we can hit compute. And we should see our tool paths on the outside. So let's go ahead and blank these out. Here's our rough passes right there. And here is our finish passes. Now the change, the one little change I want to make just to see what the difference is, just, just to kind of compare. I'm going to copy the feature two axis with geometry. If you're using version 34, we can go copy with geometry. Otherwise, just go copy and you'll have to repick the same exact geometry. 
And I'm going to paste that feature. And yes, I am using the same top and depth. So it does remember the geometry we had. Again, if you're using 33 or under, just copy and paste and then repick those lines is what you'll have to do. And I just want to edit this and add an extension uh, just to see if it ends up colliding with my part at all. So right there's my extension, 50% on the start and 50% on the end. We'll hit compute and we'll see what that looks like and see if it causes any problems. It looks like it's going to work. In which case, I don't need to go so crazy with my leads. Uh, but let's go ahead and blank it out. And we can kind of compare the two of them. So there's one. There's the other. Looks like it's straightened out on that edge. Sometimes with curves, you never know. I've had it follow the curve more. And it ends up dipping into the wall a little bit. But that looks pretty good. We'll kind of see which one we like more when we go to run it. Uh, and there it is. So there's that. All right, turn that off, turn that on. So now we'll go ahead and save. And we'll look at our first profile rough and profile finish here. And this one might give us a weird cut because it's going to do the outside as well because uh, of the way I have it sorted. Yeah, there's the profile rough right there for operation six. Uh, I might want to move that down. Eh, it really doesn't matter. We'll find out. All right, so run it. There's all our holes once again. Going to size them all up. Size up the big one. Size up the slot. And then we have our finish pass. Oh, there's the outside. Never mind. So it cuts it. That looks pretty good. And then this quarter inch should really finish it nicely. There it is. Overall, not bad. Um, Is that just the shimmer of the wall? Yep. So that one works. It, it works just fine. So that's with no extensions turned on. And then what I want to do is just real fast run the other one with the extensions and just see if we have any other results. If it's any different than that, you know, we'll see. And I'll fast forward through it just so we get the final result here. <coughs> All right, so we'll run that. And I cannot see a single difference. So whether or not you want to use the extensions, totally up to you. It uh, doesn't seem to have made a, a bit of difference for the finish we have. Uh, I would probably prefer the, I like the the extensions. It's not a feature I get to use too often, um, but that is a good feature to just kind of extend past your walls a little bit. So, all right. So once again, I'll give that a save and then that's it. All right. So just to look at uh, one of your guys' problems, this is Brock. Uh, he's trying to machine around a boss uh, in his part, but it seems like no matter what he does, the it pockets out the boss. Uh, might be easier to send the part. Okay, good. So let me get this part file downloaded here. Track tightener. All right, so save as. I will put this. Um, let me see. All right, let me make a new folder for you real quick, Brock. Son of a gun. Or I probably won't even have to send this back if it works. Let's see. So let's go Brock webinar, webinar. There we go. All right. And save. All right. So once again, give that a save. Minimize this. Let me find my folder. There it is. There it is. And right there. All right. So this is the... Uh, the, this track tightener, it's so right now I don't have the correct machine, uh, but we'll see what it looks like. All right. And so, yeah, you have a foot all VMC from V29. So here's what you're going to have to do, uh, Brock, just so you know, this, I'm going to change to my BC three X mill. When you get this part file back, you're going to need to change that back to your machine for this or or you're just follow what i'm doing all right so he said the boss on the left when you look at the part so this thing right this whole thing or just this this part of it uh let's do one or two the smaller square this guy right here yes perfect all right so you're trying to go from here around we got some extra geometry there. 
around and then is is so i'm i'm the way i'm picturing this is is this right here a wall and then this right here is on a different level okay good so let me trim off the extra here so he said i could trim off that extra there was that little bit there cancel out and then I want to, uh, let's see, I want to, first, I'm just going to do a cleanup optimize on this just in case, not that I don't trust you. Right there, hit OK. And uh, so we had a lot of corrections just made, which when you're doing 2D or, or wireframe two axis tool pathing, that right there could be a big thing. Because if you're accidentally picking pieces of geometry that are no good, it could break it. What I also might have just done is if you broke this part uh, apart at some point, uh, I might have just rejoined it all together. So I will have to separate some geometry, uh, but we'll try it right here. So I'm thinking we do this as an open pocket. All right. And basically we use this edge here. Uh, we'll do really, let's just, uh, let's just try it out. I'm going to make a new layer. And I'm going to call it open pocket. Let's try this thing. So open pocket. And I actually do this kind of weird uh, a, a way a lot of people might not do it. Uh, I actually go in and I copy and paste the geometry. Uh, I don't like to move the original. So I'm going to grab this line around. Uh, we'll go down to here. And then I'll grab all this geometry. I'm trying to avoid having the holes in there just so I don't accidentally pick them. And then I'm also going to grab all this geometry here as well as the actual pocket we need to work on. So I grab all that geometry. I go up to the home tab and say copy, then cancel out. This is important. Make sure you right click and cancel after you copy. Turn off all your other layers, make sure the check marks on the new layer and then paste. So the way I'm picturing this and whether or not we include this little thing here is this is a wall. Uh, actually, I think I'm missing a line. That's a wall. So let me grab that one just for my own sake here. So copy, cancel, and paste. So this is a wall. And we want to do an open pocket around this, leaving this boss standing up a quarter of an inch. Oh, there's a oh, is there a solid? Oh, there's a solid the whole time. Well, one, our geometry's shifted. The bigger part is a quarter inch lower. Yeah. Okay. Good. I was picturing it exactly as I uh, exactly as I thought I was. So that's perfect. Uh, for some reason, the solid and the wireframe is shifted from each other a little bit. Uh, looks like you might have translated. Yeah. Probably this translate right here. Uh, but not a big deal. All right. So that lets me visualize it. So what I want to do real quick. Ooh, you son of a gun! I didn't realize that was all on different levels. All right, so I need to flatten this all out. So this could be your problem right here. Um, I think we're going to want to have that all on the same Z level uh, right there. So I'm going to just take a measurement of this right here where it's sitting. And it is at a quarter inch tall. It's at Z.25. So I'm just going to take all this geometry, uh, create no, sorry, utilities and translate. And I'm going to translate that all down onto the same level. Remember, when you're doing your, your depths and stuff, it doesn't really, uh, what was Z minus 0.25. When you're doing your depths and you're working kind of wireframe like this, or especially yours, you have a solid model, uh, you can pick the depths. Don't you have all your geometry on one layer. It'll make it a lot easier to work with. So looking at the CAD model, all of this is going to stay a solid line and pretty much all of this. So we'll go from here. We're going to try and do this all together uh, just to see, but we might have to change some things. And then from here around to here, 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 and here. Yep. Just like that. We're going to right click modify attributes line style and then go dotted and hit okay uh now i might have to do this one separately just because of that little just because it's its own thing but now i'm just going to go ahead and quick trim this and i'll trim off that and that and again this is why i make a copy because if i mess something up it's no big deal i'm also going to trim out the inside of that 
just for now. So the next thing I would do is find out what size tool I could fit through here. And uh, the way I actually do that is I just sketch a line. You could go from the center point here straight over. Um, that one's actually fine. I usually overextend a little bit like so. And then I just trim off the end of it real quick. And then if I measure that line, that'll be pretty close to what I can fit through that area. So that's going to be a, so it's a half inch wide about. So that's perfect. We'll use a, what do you prefer? I was going to, I was thinking like a half inch or three eighths, three eighths would be nice. I think. Uh, what do you think? Why didn't this change? It did change. I got, I do have duplicates here. I think there and there, let me delete that. Yep, there was definitely duplicates on it. So that's not duplicates anymore. Entity modify or any modify attributes, line style. There we go. So that's dotted. So if I hold shift now, just to just to double check everything, if I hold shift and click, it's going to go there. So the tool is allowed to leave over that edge. Yep, that's where it's going to leave from. And you could possibly, we might possibly need to extend this. We'll find out. Sometimes when you get these, these edges, these sharp corners, the tool will leave and wrap around and hit the wall. Um, but we'll try it out without it. So uh, he said, let's go with a half inch to rough, quarter inch to finish. All right, mill. Uh, I can walk through the whole thing. Yeah, so mill two axis, select geometry. Again, hold shift when you pick your geometry to ensure that you're getting good geometry. With you, with the way we had this originally, the geometry being on two different levels would have messed everything up. You couldn't hold shift. And I actually think there was a duplicate here the whole time that I somehow missed. Um, now the top, let's go here. Let's turn on our CAD model. We're going to say that the top of the geometry is, uh, I'm just going to pick it off the solid here, your origin your origin's there. Okay, so we're going to say the top is here. Don't know why it picked it that way. And the bottom is down on that level there. So quarter inch deep, hit OK. And then go next. Uh, next again. Yeah, quarter, yep, that's fine. So we're going to go with pocketing with a pocket and a profile finish here. Um, and just kind of next our way through. So here we have a half, or that's our quarter inch. We got a half inch in here, half inch flat. There you go. So the problem I could see having here, uh, I'll go with an advanced pocket. Remember, you can't do open pocketing with a with a standard pocket. I'll go with an offset pocket out even. We'll find out if that's right. Uh, step over percentage. Now, this is where it could get a little bit weird. And that half inch rougher could be a problem uh, because we only have, you know, uh, about a half inch, you know, 506. Uh, and so the way you got to kind of think about this is, when we get to the next page, when we do our allowance, we got to take that off of the amount that we have. So if we have, let's call this an even half inch, and we set our allowance to 15 thousandths, that's going to be 15 thousandths off that wall and 15 thousandths off that wall. So you take your half inch, you subtract your 30 thousandths, you just add the two of them together, and we're left with 470. That might be a big reason why your half inch tool doesn't fit here. But let's let's change it up a bit. What I'm going to do is I'm going to add another pocket into here. So I got a pocket. That's going to be my half inch. I got another pocket that I'll use as a quarter inch. And then I have my profile finish, which I'll use my quarter inch for. Or you could use a three ace on the second pocket or just do just do a pocket and a profile finish and switch to a switch to a three ace tool. Most of your three ace tools take off as much as your half inch tool anyway, because the chip loads uh, usually the same. So something to think about, but we'll go with our half inch first. Uh, we're going to do the offset pocket out. We'll do a step over of, you know, I'll just say 25%, um, nothing too crazy. You could also go with adaptive roughing and do some high speed machining on that. Uh, side allowance, 15 thou. Uh, we'll do it in one pass, quarter inch. Leads, I'll just plunge in with the open pocket. We should be starting off the geometry. Uh, machine sequencing, optimized. Links, advanced feeds, done. All right, so the second pocket we're going to use is quarter inch tool. 
On the uh, patterns of this, though, we're going to use an advanced pocket, again, with the offset pocket out, and the same, we'll say, 25% step over. This time, though, I'm going to turn on rest roughing. <coughs> so this toolpath should recognize all the locations where the half-inch tool already cut and just go add the extra toolpath that's needed to clean those up. So it should be able to get into this back area and give us a clean finish. Again, going with a three-ace tool, we could avoid one of these tool paths altogether, uh, but it's up to you. So leads, not too worried about any of that stuff there. Uh, we will it's only one pocket, so optimize doesn't really matter. And then profile finish, we're going to use, uh, we got a half-inch finisher. We'll use our quarter-inch tool once again. And next, compensation, going to turn on double comp for left. Uh, that's all good. Looking at this, I don't know what lead is going to be the best. I'll usually go circular in that case because we do have it. It should treat this like an open ended uh, cut here, like a just an open profile. Uh, rule of thumb, let's go with an eighth inch length and an eighth inch radius, just half the tool diameter. Next, my way through. Uh, and then I'll just hit compute and we'll see if this leaves that boss. All right, so we blank everything out. Let's get this cat out of here. There we go. So that leaves us the boss. The problem is the uh, finish pass on here is a little bit backwards. That's an easy change, though. Let's go ahead and blank that out. So here's our first pocket, and that's what I was talking about. I knew this was going to happen when it got back here uh, just because of the the spacing that's back there. And you always have to take the, the distance that you have, you know, our, our half inch, and then remember to subtract your allowance even if we only left you know five thousandths on either wall that's still ten thousandths of allowance that makes this gap a little bit too small so that could be a problem there was also that duplicate piece of geometry i don't know if that was me or yours so check yours make sure you don't have duplicates there i noticed it when i converted it to a uh, dotted line that there was still a solid line through it so look at that so there's our first half inch again doesn't fit there then we use our quarter inch. It just goes in and cleans up that area. And then we use our quarter inch once again. Now you'll see that this, uh, this finish pass is going the wrong way. And that's just the direction that the, that the chain is pointing in. So right here under default chain start point, I'm going to right click on that and say modify. I'm going to pick, uh, let's go, we'll go right there. And then I'm going to click the tip of the arrow. And that was something I should have fixed at the beginning of this. When I first picked the geometry, I should have checked that out, um, you know, right there and then hit OK. And now when I go and recompute this whole thing, I, I didn't need to recompute the whole thing. I just needed the finish pass. There it is on the outside. So there we have it. So Brock said, I think it's me. I didn't extract edges because I did translate my CAD to be in a better position. Absolutely. The one thing you want to do when you do your extract edges next time. Uh, and look here, I'll just, I'll, let me just copy and, oh, this is multiple models here. Wait, hold on here. You got two, you got two bosses here. This one's sitting at what height? This one's sitting at Z quarter inch. And then there's one below it. Oh, I can't get it. I got to turn that off. And then there's another one sitting at 0.24. Imported from Fusion. Um, usually, usually when we import, we just bring in the, the origin, wherever it was at in whatever CAD system it came from. So... Fusion shouldn't really have anything to do with it. Um, let me grab, I'm just going to grab all these pieces here and I'm just going to go home, copy. And then I'll go home or, or new window, sorry, new window, then home and paste. So there it is right there. Uh, your origin is on that floor. I got what you did. You moved your part. So your origin was in the right spot. Got it. That makes sense. Uh, so one thing you could do, and, and this could help avoid getting some of the extra stuff, uh, would be to, when you do your extraction of your edges, before you do it, try and add the model together. Um, you don't need to, but it might make your life a little bit easier 
uh, if it's all one piece. So it's a real easy process. It might not work though, just depending on how everything adds together. Uh, but I'm gonna go with add, and I'm just gonna pick all four of these pieces here, and then always turn on show preview. If your preview disappears and nothing stays there, then you have a bad piece of geometry. Um, if it all shows up like it did here, we can just hit okay. And now when we go and touch that model, it's all gonna light up as one. Did that make any difference to what we're doing right now? Absolutely not. It just makes it easier for me to think about when it's all one piece. When you go to extract your edges next time, um, the first thing I would do is kind of find out where you wanna work. We, remember with, with two axis tool paths, we really don't care about where the geometry sits above or below the part. Uh, but we do need all, we do want, we don't need it, but we do want all that geometry to be on the same, on the same Z plane. So what we ran into earlier was there was that piece uh, that was, you know, a quarter inch higher than the rest of it. And that usually just comes from you extracted this edge of lines and then you extracted this edge or whatever, uh, whatever order you did it in. When you think about the height of something floating above your geometry, and you guys have heard me say this when I talk about three axis tool paths with boundaries. A boundary can sit above a part 100 inches. It doesn't matter because when we look at it or when, you're, when Bobcad's creating the tool path and when your machine's machining it, we're always looking down on the Z. We're always looking there. And at this point, when you're looking at it from this view, there's no way to tell what height anything is. This right now could be a pocket that goes into the part a little bit. It could be a pocket that sticks out two inches or a boss that sticks out two inches. We really don't know when we're working with this kind of geometry. So what I usually do is, you know, get your stuff perfect. And, and I, I like the way you got this. You put your, your part right on the origin. That's what we're going to use when we go to do our cam, when we do our stock. So right here, I'll just create this piece of stock. I don't know what you use. I'm just going to use that for now. And then your origin is already there. And Brock just said, so I really want my origin to be on the bottom left of the part. Like the bottom, this corner right here? Oh, yeah. So when you're going through your stock wizard, all you got to do is uh, click the origin button here and then pick that, pick that point. That'll put you in the bottom left-hand corner. <laughs> I was thinking you were all swift putting it right there. You did the right thing, uh, and a lot of you guys could do this. For those of you that don't like to uh, move the origin around, you'd rather have your part sitting at the origin, this is exactly what it should look like. That's what you'd want to do. Brock actually wants it in this normal mode. So I'll do, I'm going to do something after this as well uh, to show you guys. So there, ugh, there is our origin now. And so I'll hit OK and just blank out my stock. Now for the geometry, all right, I'm going to go over here, add a new layer, and I'm going to call this open pocket, all right? And on the open pocket, we're going to go to create 2D and extract edges. But before we pick any geometry, we're going to click this button right here, project to a Z plane. I don't care if you go to Z0. I don't care if you go to one inch. The solid model that we have is going to let us tell the system what the height is, where we're at, and how deep we want to go. So projecting to a Z plane, I'm going to project to Z. I'll, I mean, 0.25, I think, is the right answer here, but I'm going to go 0.5. And then I'm just going to go and pick that floor there and that little floor there and hit OK and cancel out. Now, if I turn off my CAD model, I'm left with all of that geometry. So now I'll go in and I'll pick the holes. One, two, three, four. Delete them. And then I'll go and pick all my geometry from here. Uh, we go around to here. And then all of this. So from here. And all I'm doing for this, by the way, just so you guys know, I'm clicking the first entity and going to the end of the last entity, holding shift and then clicking. And that's doing a, a chain between your two clicks. It'll grab between your two clicks. Then I'm going to right click. Modify attributes, line style, dotted, okay. Make sure you inspect that real quick. If you see any solid lines that show up through there, it's probably an extra piece of geometry that didn't get picked. And then for the uh, tool path itself, I'm just gonna copy the one we made. 
and then I'm going to jump over here and I'll paste it. Now it's going to ask if we want to use the same top of feature and depth because we picked a new origin. I do not want to pick the same uh, top of feature because the top of feature on the old part was a quarter inch. Now we're at zero. So I'm going to say, do not uh, do the top of feature and depth. And then for the geometry, I'll just right click, say reselect. And uh, I always like to hold shift when I pick my geometry because I feel like it's the safest way to go. And you know what? We'll try and do this pocket as well, see if we can do them all together. I think they're at the same depths. Now, notice that the geometry we selected is way higher than is shown right here. It knows that the top of part is where we put our origin. And the top of part's currently at zero. So we just have to come in and say, pick bottom, pick an edge that represents the depth we want to go to, and then hit OK. And we'll go ahead and recompute and see what this thing gives us. Hey, looking good. All right. Blank it out. We got our pocket. We got our secondary pocket there, the uh, the rest rough pocket. And then we have our little profile finish and a tool path on the inside still. So let me reverse the direction of that. So modify, pick it, flip it, OK it and recompute it. There we go. That puts us on the right side. So there we go. That's our little little pocket right there. <coughs> Uh, yeah, that's it. Now, I do want to show you guys one last thing. Let me save this thing for you real quick, Brock. Uh, where is it? That, 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 that. I'll put that on there so you know this one's mine. I'll email that to you here in a little bit. <clears throat> All right, now, the last bit, which is the origin. So a lot of guys get confused with this, uh, and I think we're having some confusion here on Brock's end. It does not matter where this part sits inside of Bobcat. So I'm going to go to Utilities and Translate, and as long as this is the, you know, as long as all of the geometry is in the same spot, I'll keep it somewhat in, in bounds over here. Uh, I'm going to hit OK and cancel out. So the way you could first find out, one, is all the geometry in the same spot? Uh, well, there's a real easy way to find out, and it's just by doing a fit all. Uh, if you hit that magnifying glass with the um, A inside of it, right there, it'll find the geometry. If it zooms in and, it, and it's you know something like that, there's another piece of geometry somewhere else in the screen that's telling it that it's not allowed to kind of zoom in. Uh, but I'm just going to fit all. There's our part. Now, again, it is more difficult rotating out here. Um, but it's not too bad. It's more difficult when you're way far. We're 70 inches away from the origin, but no big deal. So again, when I go to my cam tree and I start my new job and I, I go to my stock wizard and I do all this stuff, it finds that part for me, no matter where it's sitting in the window. It doesn't matter that it's not right here at, you know, at XYZ0. It finds it in the window. And then when I hit next right here, we say forward. Those points show up. If you always want to use this left-hand corner, you're going to click on origin. You're going to pick it right there. Hit OK. And let me just blank this out real fast to open pocket. And I just need to get my geometry once again. So extract edges, Z, uh, 0.5. And I'll just pick that floor and that floor. OK. And... From here, here, that, 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 delete all those. And then for this one, I'll do it the opposite way. That to here, and then that whole thing, and then that edge there. Now I'm going to drag a box over it and deselect everything that was selected and pick up the stuff that wasn't and convert all of that stuff to dotted lines. All right, that looks good. Now. I'm going to do the same thing I did before, copying and pasting, just because it's easy. And I should be able to use the same depth and everything. So I'll paste that. This time I'll say yes. Geometry. We will pick it. Uh, we got chains right here. I want to go there. It got the chain right that time. Got the chain wrong that time. And that chain's also wrong. Yeah, that should be fine. And then I'll go ahead and hit OK and compute. I think I got it all right that time. 
Yeah, that looks good. Finish, finish. Oh, finishes are on the wrong side there. So let me modify this guy. And uh, I, I guess we'll, let's put it right there and to the left. That'll put us in, nope, that way is where I want to go. Okay, good. All right, and compute. Get on the right side this time. I was lying. Only one of them was good. Uh, right here to the left. There we go. Put this on the inside. Perfect. Okay, good. Okay. And compute. All right, last cap. That last time. There we go. So the difference between where this thing's sitting now, if we were to go, I mean, depending on the, the start point or whatever the cuts are or anything, if I post the code here, and this should be pretty generic code. Uh, let's look at line number four here, this G90 and then the XY. And let me go over here and let me post the code here. Uh, I think it's pretty close. 2999. I think they're starting in the same spot. Yeah. So notice that the code between these two, this just you we're just looking at line number four here. Uh X minus point two nine nine nine. And that's on the the one that's around the origin there. Look over there, we got X minus two point nine 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 nine, and then three point seven nine oh two. 3.7902. The code is exactly the same, regardless of where we put this inside the CAD workspace. It's all based off of where we put that origin. So on your original one, where we have that origin right there, when we go to post the code, it's going to be the distance from that origin there to the first cut. And that's why we have different values right there. It's going to, I don't know where the exact first cut is. It's uh, Well, actually, we could look real quick. So the first cut, back plot, there it is, is starting right here. So that's the location in which it's starting. And I'm pretty sure, let's look at the other one real quick. Uh, we'll do this one because I got the tool path on. This one, back plot, is also starting in that exact same location, but you'll see the differences in their, in their code over there. So that'll be the... Uh, That'll be the big thing. Just making sure you pick the right origin. Uh, again, when you're going through your stock, it's going to be the last page of the stock wizard. A lot of people hit OK one step too early when they're doing their stock wizard. Uh, let me do this. You know, a lot of people will get to this point where they've just defined this, and then they have their part in the you know they have their part kind of in a spot like you did. Your your origin was at you know, X, Y, Z, zero, your part was situated there. So when you hit OK here, you miss out on the last page of the stock wizard. And the last page is the one where you're going to pick your origin. It's one of the most important ones. So you go to your origin. And then, yeah, just always pick that bottom left-hand corner. <coughs> if you're running a mill, you're usually going off the top of the part. For any of you guys that might be running a, a router, uh, you're either going to go off the top of the part or the spoil board. Uh, it really depends on how the how the router's set up. Um, some of them don't really let you pick the Z level. It's all based off that spoil board. So something to, something to think about. Um, but yeah, that's it. All right, let me get rid of that extra one. Delete that. Yes. All right, let me save this. And uh, yeah, I'll send it back to you. All right, attach the file right there. All right, Brock, I'm sending it back to you now. Just make sure that when you get it, you have to right click on this where it says BC3X mill and then go pick that, uh, what do you have, Fidal or Fagor. Pick your machine and then when you go to simulate it, it should show up with all the right stuff and the right, it'll have the right code to it. So there you go. All right, that's, uh, I'm, I'm, Pretty much, I'm out of time. I mean, I'm almost out of time. I got time for some questions if you guys got them. Um, so if you guys have some questions, let me know. And uh, let me know what you think. If you guys like this method a little bit more, we did a, we changed this from last year. We went from, we used to do four hours for this. We dropped it down to two and we're doing it in the afternoon. So, and we went to Wednesdays. We used to do Tuesdays and Thursdays. So it's just going to be Wednesdays from now on. Um, Yep, from one to three. And we're still going to go over the same kind of stuff. 
uh, one of the one of the complaints we got from you guys when I sent out my my um, little survey was that it it's a little too long sometimes. So uh, yeah, we dropped it down to two hours for this year. We're gonna see how it goes. This is the first one, and I I wish it was more prepped on my end. I I was off work last week, so I didn't prep all of this beforehand. <laughs> so um, yeah, if you guys got any questions, feel free to throw them in the questions box. And if you guys have any part files like Brock did, feel free to send those in and uh, we'll look at them and, and see where we could squeeze them in. As long as you're okay with other people seeing your part files, um, it's one thing you could do. So yeah, send us part files. If you guys want us to go through some of your stuff, that'll help you. It's kind of, uh, we, we run out of things to talk about pretty quickly when we're making up our own parts. So as you can see from how simple I went today. So, <laughs> so, all right, guys, I'll, like I said, I'll be here for a few minutes. If you guys have any questions, I'll pop back in. Otherwise have a good one. We'll see you next week. If you want to join next week is on, ooh, what is it on next week is laser plasma water jet specific. So yeah, if you guys have any questions or anything that comes up, let us know. Otherwise, uh, yeah, we'll see you next week or in two weeks. Uh, which is the 19th. Um, we have our 3D CAD and CAM, um, which I might have to actually cancel because none of the trainers are going to be here. So I'll figure it out and let you guys know. Thanks, Brock. Have a good one. And uh, yeah, if you guys have any questions, I'll be here for a few. Cool. Two questions. Thanks. Uh, oh, no problem, Randolph. Have a good one. All right. So, Mike, do people use the USC settings along with setting the origin? 